And it's a very good afternoon to the sports fan radio panel and uh, welcome back to a couple of faces in uh, our US correspondent, Dan Butley, and also to uh, Sarah Radlow. Welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be back. And we might start uh, in the US, Dan. Uh, Catherine Roach, 32, promoted by the Philadelphia Eagles, an NFL team to the very important position of Vice President of Football Operations. Uh, surely that's not a token uh, appointment. No, Mark, it, it, obviously they definitely celebrate the hire as a diverse hire, a, a woman uh, being in a, a very lead position in the, in, in the NFL. When you become a foot, uh, Vice President of Football Operations, it is what it is. You are running the football team from scouting to drafts to uh, salary cap, everything that has to do with football operations. That is a central and vital position for a team that spends over $200 million a year on salaries um, and obviously a billion dollar franchises. So not only a female being in that position, which kudos, uh, she has to have the, the knowledge and the experience to be able to take a position like that, but she's also 32 years old, which is very unique in itself uh, being so young and having that type of experience. So great news by the Eagles, uh, wishing her all the success that she can gain there with the Eagles. Can I ask a serious question, Dan? Americans place great emphasis on vice president. Is there actually a president or is it just the vice is the top? Because you always hear from the vice person, never the top. Yeah, it's usually the, the owner is usually the top person. You usually have a CEO, Paul, um, yeah. and then you have vice presidents under that. Every football team is set up differently. I know the Denver Broncos, uh, John Elway is the president uh, of the football team, and then they've got vice presidents underneath him. But every football team is different. Usually the vice president of football operations uh, is generally that number two position in the overall football organization, whether it's the CEO or there is a president. But again, that's a vital position in making some very bold calls for a football team. Hmm. Well, the, the other thing I noticed, Dan, was that there was another appointment also of a female uh, to be in charge of the uh, team's scouting operations. Uh, so you've got two females who are effectively assessing talent. Um, how does that go down in the professional world of men's sport? Well, it's definitely, uh, you know, groundbreaking. It's definitely something that everybody out there started to celebrate. I mean, again, when uh, you're putting a, a very big emphasis on diversity and inclusion and, and providing opportunities um, for females in the sports world, particularly in the, in the men's sports side of things, it is definitely groundbreaking. And um, it, it's going to be very interesting uh, when you look at the, those positions and, and the seniority of those positions, the importance of those positions, as I said earlier, the teams don't just do that for diversity. They do that because those women have that experience to take on those roles and exceed and, and improve the team in those roles. So again, it's not just a diversity. They have to know what they're doing. And the only comparison I can think of in Australia would be uh, not just running a team, in view of the amount of money involved, would be a 32-year-old female stepping in to take over the AFL. Now, let me just tell you, that ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen, wouldn't happen, wouldn't have for, for years it was going to. Has this made a huge ruckus in America or is it sort of business as usual? You know, it's, it's not that unexpected. Well, Judge, I think it's, it's not as unexpected. It, it, it's, that's why I brought it up earlier. 32 years old and being in that position is much more unique than for me, than being a woman and being in that position. I mean, you celebrate both of them, but you, but you think of ba your baseball, Theo Epstein. When Theo Epstein became the GM of the, of the Boston Red Sox, he was young and people focused on his youth uh, coming into that position and he, he led Boston to a World Series. They're not necessarily talking about her age, but her gender in this position. I think that's very unique. If it was a man, they'd be talking about how young, 32 years old, is a VP of football operations. But because she's a woman, they focus on the woman and not necessarily the age. So it is a little bit of a, of a gender discrepancy there. But again, 32 years old and being vice president of football operations, if you looked at the average age of somebody in that position across the NFL, I, I would anticipate it's probably closer to 50 on the average age than 30 or 40. Dan, she's not an outlier, though, because the Denver Broncos have also appointed a female to as their executive director of football operations. Absolutely, Mark, in very similar situation, uh, looking at diversity uh, in the team, but also in the scouting ranks as well. Um, you, again, you don't, she is also young, as I recall. Uh, she took, she got her experience with the Minnesota Vikings with the, the new GM of the of Denver Broncos, worked for the um, Minnesota Vikings with her. So they have a very good relationship. 
in that respect. The, the woman that's taken over the, the Philadelphia Eagles position actually came from the Canadian Football League background. So a very unique uh, subset of experience to come in the, into the NFL and take on that role. Let's hope that uh, the sad world we live in, that people focus on her abilities. We had a prime minister here not long ago, Julia Gillard, and people focused on her hair and the way she spoke and what she wore. When you've got Bill Belichick looking like a homeless bum uh, in his hoodie, you'd hope that uh, people don't focus on how she looks and you, you would hope that people would focus on her abilities. Well, Paul, the, I think the tough, it, it, it's the tough part is the market she's in. It's Philadelphia. This is the this is the city that booed Santa Claus at a football game years ago. It, you know, it's going to be a challenge no matter who's in that role, uh, because obviously it's one of the toughest uh, blue blue collared sports markets uh, in the United States. So it doesn't matter. Again, if she's getting the job done, you know, they'll love her. But if, if there's any hiccup, she'll be treated just like any other person in that position. Dan, she must have a remarkable skill set. I don't know if you know much about her, but uh, do you know what her background is? Is a, for instance, analytics. Um, it's just an extraordinary achievement at 32 to be doing what she's doing. Yeah, she has some great experience in the Canadian Football League, Judge, and was able to bring that into the NFL. And just, again, she's only 32 with almost, a, I think, a decade, of, close to a decade of experience in the Canadian Football League, which plays a little bit different uh, brand of football than the NFL. So, again, to be able to get that position, she's had to have an unbelievably great experience and knowledge of the game to be able to step into that role. And she's, mm. she's had to have proven that to get that opportunity. Uh, Judge, just uh, by uh, way you like this, uh, by training, she's a lawyer. Is that, well, there you go. That surprised me, Professor, because um, and that, it's, it's even more remarkable because I would have thought at that age she'd have to be an absolute genius over the analytics and the, uh, the way the game is played. But um, legal skills, you wouldn't necessarily equate with that, uh, that kind of um, thinking. So that, that's, that's remarkable. Well, uh, yeah, the, foot, the football knowledge, the salary caps, uh, the legal things that you have to deal with with the NFL nowadays, it's a great subset of experience as well. But you're right. I mean, you're looking at uh, analytics, data, statistics, all the things that go into it. Again, she has to be extremely bright to take over that position. So a question for you, Sarah. How long before we see that sort of forward thinking in Australia where somebody like this is appointed in the male area of the sport, not the female area of the sport? Well, we're definitely on the way. It's hard to say how far away we are. I'd say probably in the next 10, 15 years, we're going to be seeing some of these young AFLW players that we have now moving into the business side of things and maybe developing a further interest in different aspects of the game and wanting to take those talents to not only the AFLW, but the AFL. Um, but we're already quite lucky, as we were talking about before the show started, that we have the AFLW. It creates a pathway for more women to be involved in the sport and get to, I guess, rub shoulders with some of the executives that we see in the AFLW and in the AFL, get their names out there and build their resumes through their experiences as players. And we'll also see this as well as from a grassroots level all the way up is that people more people now, as the game's grown more diverse, are falling in love with AFL. We're going to see a much more diverse group of executives at the top of the ladder in 10, 20 years once they start, I guess, working their way up there. We think about um, people of really, or women have really only been included entirely in the Australian rules game to an elite level in the last five years. If we think five years from then to when girls would be going to high school and graduating and then working their way through university and then building their careers in 15 20 years we could see a really diverse executive group at the top of not only the AFL and the AFLW but other sports who have made those leaps to include women. That's an ex excellent point Sarah. Um, Dan just coming back to you we've got the AFLW here and Nicole Livingston's the CEO but really for all intents and purposes, the AFL make the decisions and she tells the public about what the decisions are. You were talking before the show about the WNBA. Can you tell us about how they emerged from the shadow of the NBA and how long that took? Yeah, in fact, uh, Mark, the WNBA was founded in the mid-1990s, uh, by, obviously by the NBA. David Stern was the founder and David Stern was the commissioner of the, of the NBA. Uh, at the time, everybody probably realized that David Stern was there for quite a long, long time. 
uh, in the NBA, but decided to form the WNBA with a small set of teams that were owned by the NBA. Um, and really had to build and grow um, franchises and, and get owners interested. Obviously, there was there was program there was WNBA teams that came in the league and also WNBA teams that folded uh, during its history. But it wasn't until just a couple of years ago that the WNBA somewhat separated itself from the NBA by hiring its own commissioner for the first time. Uh, like Kathy Engelbert is, is her name. It was the league's first commissioner. Um, and that's really, they're really starting to get innovative. And I think the great thing about what the WNBA, the change of focus with the WNBA is rather than trying to promote the WNBA and its teams, like they do NBA teams, they came to the realization that it's a, it is a different sport. It is basketball, but it's, it's women's basketball and it's, it's watched by a different subset of demographics. And they really paid attention to that. And they were able to grow the WNBA by changing the way they market the sport. And they've up, updated some of the things they're working on this year. They've, they've significantly increased the salary cap. They're creating more interest by creating a commissioner's cup series um, <laughs> mid-season with you know, half a million dollars in prize money to be awarded. So again, the WNBA is making the right steps. They've gotten out from underneath the NBA footprint in some ways, and they're pretty much running themselves uh, with their new commissioner. Gelding, just bringing you in. Um, yes, Professor. You're, you're, you're a keen Richmond fan. How, how long before a woman's appointed a CEO at AFL level, would you say? Um, I don't know, Professor. Um, can't see it happening. Richmond have a lady president, Peggy O'Neill, who has, I think, a banking history. Footscray also has a chair person who is um, female also I think with a rich business um, history I can't really see it happening in the next decade professor but what I can see is a lot of females with um, business acumen coming in to fill the chairman's type role rather than the CEO position now um, Sally Cap was one person named potentially for Collingwood. Um, so, yeah, I can see that happening. But as far as the business running of the clubs and things like that, there just doesn't seem to be any names on the horizon, Professor. Uh, well, Professor, one of the things you're seeing here too, and I think Sarah mentioned this a little bit, but the number of, of women that are joining sports management programs in the collegiate setting, getting their college degrees, in sports administration, sports business, sports analytics uh, is growing substantially here in the United States. Uh, so that education and that next wave of, of excellent female administrators in sport is on its way here to the United States. And hopefully uh, I know a number of uh, people outside, a number of women outside of the United States are starting to take those uh, programs in the United States as well. So it's gonna be interesting to see how that growth happens across the world. Um, Dan, how long will it take from once I pass this college degree and have that then by the time they get experience in sports administration how long before they reach the top from going from the schooling and the college system into filling top positions usually i'd say you know going i would say so generally by the time you're, you're in your early 40s you can get those you know, those lead ceo type positions but again this, this individual that was just selected for the philadelphia eagles as vice president of football operations is 32 so the, the foot is on the gas on the car and moving down the highway relatively quickly. And, and I know that's one of the reasons my daughter's in the sports management program at Ohio University here in the States. She sees those opportunities growing for women in the sports business. So I think that those opportunities may be coming a little bit younger uh, than they have in the past. Well, and you've even seen that in your own field, Dan, with uh, women being appointed as commissioners of uh, college conferences. Absolutely. There, there's a great growth of women as, as the commissioners or CEOs of their own collegiate athlete, uh, athletic conferences, particularly in the, in the major college uh, level. And that's gonna continue to grow uh, in that respect in the years ahead as well. Very, very highly successful uh, people I work with. There's only 32 division one conferences in the NCAA. I'm fortunate to be one of the commissioners of one of the 32, but there, there's many unbelievably excellent women uh, leading some of these organizations at the division one level. Okay, Dan, thanks for introducing that. Uh, that's a great topic to uh, start the show. Let's now look at uh, NRL round 12. Um, 
sin bins are down, Paul, this week? Well, it's ironic uh, given the recent crackdown on the head high contact, but uh, it has been a, a very good round. I've enjoyed quite a bit of it so far, round 12. Kicked off with the Storm, who put a demolition job on the poor old Broncos. Uh, the problem for the Storm, it, it's a minor problem, but it, it is a problem. They've got too many stars. We've got a guy called Nico Hines. I haven't seen a more graceful exhibition since the David Attenborough documentary about gazelles. He, he was unbelievable, Nico Hines, and yet He's the backup. He was gliding through that storm, uh, Broncos defence like a hot knife through butter. It reminded me of one of my favourite ever players, Tamana Tahu, to the NRL fans out there. The way that he moved was lightning. And, and he, as I said, he's the backup. The Storm were missing, if you don't mind, Cameron Munster, Pappenhausen at the back, and Harry Grant. That's three quarters of their spine, as we always talk about. There's only four in the spine, and they were missing three of them. And yet they absolutely built it, the Broncos at home. And this was a Broncos team, <coughs> I thought, were an outside chance in that match. So obviously <coughs> not. So the Storm have some issues on their hands. Nico Hines, you will hear it, heard it here first, will probably go to the Dragons, who've moved on one of our favourites, Matt Dufty, or they've given him the dreaded, uh, you can look around, which is the equivalent in coaching of you've got the board's full support that we often <laughs> discuss. Uh the Broncos just woeful. <coughs> They're also going to fit in Brandon Smith somehow in that storm lineup. Uh, he wants to start. He wants to play regularly. He could be headed to your dogs, Professor. We'll see what happens there. Uh, the Cowboys had a good win at home by one point over the very unpredictable Warriors. Uh, the Tigers continued the Dragons' woe. Woes. I mean, the Dragons have just fallen off a cliff, so there's some real issues there. Uh, Dane Laurie at the Tigers... Is on $150,000 a year. That's the best value since the first Audi catalogue. Unbelievable player at the Tigers. So finally, some good news for Tigers fans. Uh, the Premier elect, I'll call it now. I'll, I'll call it now. Who's going to win the, this year's Premiership? The Panthers. They are hot. Absolutely they are, they are on fire. So the Bulldogs, Paul. I'll call it in round 12. I can't see those Panthers being beaten. They're, unless something happens to Nathan Cleary, who's their star halfback, who'll be the first picked for New South Wales. Uh, they were too good for the dogs. Your dogs actually played all right, Professor. That's the scary thing. And yet the Panthers still turned on more fireworks than Chinatown on New Year's Eve. So, uh, And the thing that people aren't talking about as much, the Panthers are setting records on the defensive side. So they often say that defence wins premierships. They've got it on both sides of the equation. So I just can't see them not winning the premiership. I'll call it in round 12. I've called the last five. Winners, as you know, Professor, I think last five seasons. So I'll, I'll say it now. That, and they'll probably play the storm the way they're going. Rabbitohs back in form. Cody Walker put on a fine state of origin uh, da, um, audition. I'd, I don't know if you'll get the gig over Jerome Luai at the Panthers. They'll probably go with Cleary and Jerome Luai for the Panthers, uh, for, the, for the New South Wales six and seven. Sad news for us, Professor, our dates. We don't have news for the listeners, but our, our non-romantic date at the uh, at the State of Origin won't be happening unless we can somehow get to Townsville. So they're going to move that game from the MCG, which is a shame. I was looking forward to it. Had my best shirt ready to go for you, Professor, but uh, our date won't be happening. So pack away the candles <laughs> and we'll be watching it, watching it on TV, unfortunately, which is a shame for, uh, for Melbourne because I was really looking forward to that game. Some um, suspensions going to come out of that Rabbitohs and Eels game. Uh, Reed Mahoney, who sounds like he should have been in Police Academy, but uh, he was going to be the uh, the Queensland hooker if Harry Grant wasn't good to go. He won't be playing, I don't think, because of a high contact issue. Cameron Murray, one of the Rabbitohs' best players, he could be facing some judiciary problems as well. Uh, he would have been straight into the Blues lineup. So a few headaches for Freddie Fittler, the Blues coach, uh, and we'll see what happens there. The Roosters missing plenty of players. Did a number on the Raiders. Um, Ricky Stewart has got to be in more trouble down there than uh, who, I don't know who than some of the politicians in Canberra because he he is he is in all sorts of trouble. He's lost the dressing room, uh, and we'll see what what happens there. But the, the Raiders have just they've got players leaving. They've got captains fighting. He's lost the dressing room. So I I, I don't know if you want that to be a segue into uh, Peter Volandis, but uh, no, not, no, not yet. But what I wanted to ask was. Uh... The Raiders let go a player during the week, Paul. You and I had some uh, discussions about it. Um, 
the club gave him the marching order, said he wanted to leave and go back home. The player then came out and said, well, no, I said I'd stay till the end of the season and they just told me that that was it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the club's got to look after their interests. If, if a player's going to leave and they get nothing for him, if they can free him up now, the thing is they don't want to miss out on the, uh, the merry-go-round of halfbacks. So as we know, halfbacks don't grow on trees. That's what Kuda does when he appears uh, on the show. But they, they want to free up the money now, get rid of him, and oh, they don't want to miss out on a, on a halfback because they might be stuck with no one for next year. So I can understand their position. If, if a player doesn't want to be at a club, you can't force them to be there. For whatever reason, this, this guy wants to go back to England. There's a real problem with that team if someone wants to do that as opposed to wanting to play in the best premiership in, in the world. So there's got to be some real issues there. Whether it's homesickness, I'm not sure, but uh, he's on good money. He, he's in a or was in a pretty good team. So it's an interesting decision, but it certainly shows the problems that are at the Raiders. Paul, can I just ask about your confidence in the Panthers? Um, it's clearly, um, you, you believe they're far and ahead of the other teams in the league. The reason why most of us don't pick a Premier mid season is because of injuries. But yep. you, I think what you're saying is that they're so deep that, irrespective, unless there's a, you know, there's a COVID outbreak in the team, that they're pretty much uh, going to get home. They've got a better nursery there than Jamie Jury's ever created. They, they have about two or two million people to pick from out there. And the reason GWS hasn't taken off is because everyone plays rugby league in those parts. Uh, they've, they've got so much depth. I did say, though, that it is subject to injuries. If, if the team that's playing now is still out there at finals time, I can't see them being stopped. I, I, hope, I don't think I've ever seen a much better team. The Storm, though, were the ones who are the obvious danger. They, they keep losing players and they keep finding these players. This Nico Hines, as, as a you, you've got to remember, everyone thought Billy Slater's gone, they're going to struggle. Well, then Pappenhausen steps up, who's just a freak of an athlete, very good speaker as well, very, very good uh, game manager. And then this Nico Hines, even Craig Bellamy said he was surprised at how well he played. So uh, I just think the Storm and Panthers will be your grand finalists. Uh, my rabbitos, as much as I'd love a trip up to Sydney, if we're out of lockdown by then, uh, I just don't think that we can match those two teams at the moment. So injuries permitting, uh, they're, they're the two far and away best teams. And, and, and the blowout score is a bit of a concern for rugby league. I used to say it was very difficult to, to pick this game, but it's becoming more and more uh, gilding it like this. The favourites are winning much more often. Uh, in the NRL. You're not sort of getting the results, for example, like Essendon beating West Coast, which is just a, would have been a $4 pop. Uh, that's not happening as much in the in the rugby league this year. So that's part of the reason with the Landys we'll talk about later is that some of the changes to the game are leading to these absolute poundings and blowout scores. Paul, can we talk about another day? But you raise a very good point about why GWS will never succeed. Uh, in Sydney, it's because that that Western suburbs love of rugby league, which is never represented by the, the people going to the games, um, or even the television ratings, but it is such a deep entrenched love of the game that GWS is never going to make a footprint out there. It seems to me. What, what are your thoughts? Well, they've made the biggest footprint they will. I, I just don't think their growth will be what was expected. The the rationale behind it, this was dictator Demetrio uh, came up with this, is that there's 3 million people. We only need to win 1% of them to make it work. But I think the rationale for them is that it's the increase in the TV ratings from the extra games has made them financially worthwhile. But everyone in that area either plays soccer or rugby league. And I don't think that there's a lot more AFL interest than there was before GWS, but I may be proven wrong. They have a small fan base, as you see, who don't travel. Uh, but I, I don't think they're going to grow a whole lot more despite the $30 million a year, apparently, the AFL plows into them. So I'm glad it's not my money if I had it. But they, they, they defend it on the basis of the bigger TV rights deal. Okay. Which I could get if I had a Tasmanian sorry. Well, Tasmanian would have been a much better pick because you, yeah. you're much, much more <clears throat> likely to find AFL fans there. Uh, my Melbourne mates are always surprised when they go to Sydney and AFL isn't on the TV because you take it as a given that everyone loves the sport. It's liked in Sydney, but rugby league is king and it always will be. Uh, Paul, there's two games for decision this afternoon. Uh, at two o'clock, Sharks 
against the Titans, and at 4.05, the Knights against the Seagulls. Uh, the Gelding and I have a very uh, heavy interest in the latter game. Um, we've gone for uh, Schooner's uh, Seagulls in our uh, parlay. Uh, how do you see those games going? Schooner must be that excited. He, he should be upgraded to a pint, I think, because Manly, <laughs> Manly are on fire at the moment. They could be the hottest team in the game. So you must have mixed feelings, Professor, given that Des has left the dogs, but Manly is his home team. It's his heartland, and he's got the best out of that team. And it's no surprise that Tom Trebojevic, who I once tipped to score three tries in an origin, and he did so for our listeners and punters, uh, he's back, and Manly are firing. Uh, I'll be stunned if that loses, but is it the last leg of your multi? Yes. Because the problem yes. with the last, the last leg... The last leg of the very successful Professor's Parlay. Yeah, the, the problem is, as you know, if the last leg of the multi is tomorrow being Monday, we wake up on Tuesday. So <laughs> <laughs> they call it... I don't want to jinx you, but it's called last leg syndrome. But if the Knights win, I'll be very surprised. I'll, uh, I'll go to work in a night outfit uh, when we're next back allowed in the office. The chain mail and all. <laughs> You're home. What, Get in what, the queue. What, give us give us the score. Uh, 36 to 10. There's a real problems at the Knights. They are oh. fading fast. And what about the Sharks and the Titans? Oh, well, it might be the most compelling match. I don't think the Titans... I, I think the Titans will win that, but uh, Titans aren't showing the sort of form that they'd need to if you want to get Cameron Smith to get the boots off the uh, the wall up there on the Gold Coast. That We always talked about that, that he'd come back if they were a chance. They're just not good enough. But I, I, I just think the Sharks have got some real issues. The Titans should win it. Probably 18-10, I'll call the score. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Professor, some breaking news at Ballarat Races. Yes. I've, I've um, race one, Sports Fans Radio Zone. Craig Robinson was on a first starter. There's Tyler Sermon, after listening to uh, the giraffe there. It could have been an interesting omen bet. Uh, at Central Blast, Flashed home for third, Professor, beating three quarters of a length. Paying yes. $3.90 a place. So yes, looked like what, it was going to win with about 50 metres out, but just stuck in. Yes, guess what? Uh, I got fixed at about 10.30 uh, this morning, Gelding. Uh, you would have got about $33, Professor. I got $7 fixed for the, yeah. uh, well, for, the for the place. You've collected beautifully there, Professor. <laughs> so you're on a bit of a streak. Very yeah, much well, like the uh, the side of the jacket that you're wearing. Uh, You'd have yes. to think. Haven't seen that jacket for a while, Professor. Uh, yeah, not since about three shows ago. <laughs> 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 All right, now, Paul, um, just coming back to you before we finish the NRL. I sent you a clip this morning from the age that apparently star players are trying to remove your man, Peter Volandis. What's what's the story there? Well, they're pretty annoyed, the players. They weren't consulted about the changes to the game, which I alluded to before, the blowout scores, the impact to the head. Uh, Volandis is a bull type who is just charged through, crash or crash through, with a, a giant ego. So I think this could lead... He's very wounded by this, apparently. Uh, it could lead to him just walking away, packing up the kit bag and just storming off. That's the type of personality he is. It's ironic it's a year to the day after he rescued Rugby League when no one thought it was possible. And we all joked he must have more balls than Keno. It might have been my line. Uh, and the way that he got it done is a lot of times he's just charging through with things like half the referees that we used to have. And he didn't even tell them about it until it was a Zoom meeting. said it used to be two of you boys. It's now going to be one. He is the type who just does things and often doesn't take into account the fact that there are interests involved. Everyone wants to protect the head. And it's been, as Wayne Bennett sagely pointed out, it's been part of the rules since the game started that you can't hit the head. But the way they've reacted to it uh, is that there's, there's sin bins galore and that is ruining the game. It's a balancing act though, because no one wants concussions. But I think that it's an overreaction because it, it is leading to farcical situations where you, you've also got coaches saying to players to take a dive. Now, no offence to uh, our friend Mark Fiorenti in soccer, but we don't want a situation where someone gets a scratch to the face and they act like they've been hit with a hammer. So it, it, it is already being used 
uh, for players to be diving. So you, you don't want to see games 13 against 10. You don't want to see players taking a dive, but we do want to protect the head. So um, that that's why he's in trouble. Uh, he said he consulted Wayne Bennett, but Wayne Bennett doesn't say a lot, but whatever he said didn't reach the players because they weren't consulted. The players have this view. We are aware that it is a high contact sport. We are aware of the risk and we don't want our game becoming a laughing stock. Uh, if he doesn't start taking into account the players' interests, and they are the most important people that he's trying to protect, he will go. Either, either his ego will uh, carry him out the door or he'll be knifed. So uh, it, it's a stunning turn of events because this is a guy who does need credit for, for, for getting this competition together when no one thought he could. Um, Paul, look, having a look at his background, as I said, you, you know, I know a lot about it in racing. This is the type of controversy he loves. You know, when people say he's doing the wrong thing, he just becomes more determined to do it further. And he would not give one ounce of thought to past players and their views on what they think. If he thinks it's right, he will just go along with it. And as you said, look, even last year, they, they should be aware of him. He just what? said, we're playing rugby regardless. And he was the only one that did it and he kept it alive. So that will even give him more in power that he's bettering the game. With the racing, he did not care one hoop about any other racing centre than New South Wales, which he was looking after. And he didn't care how many people he upsets. And he just becomes more dogmatic the more people that actually challenge his view. So as you said, he, you know, he'll walk away from it. I would like to back the opposite. This would encourage him to say, say more to prove these people, in his view, he says they're wrong. And he will stay there and keep changing it. And as you said, with these rule changes, is the game better for it? Better for it. The better sides are winning. Yeah, just, just on that, I, I do, with, with respect, have to disagree on this basis. He was once called a funny little man with a silly little man with funny attitudes. The, the key difference here is that was his enemy. That was his opponent. He loves the view that um, if you're with me or against me. So he was taking on Victoria as the racing minister of New South Wales, or the, ra the head of racing in New South Wales. Here, we have his army turning on him. We have his players. It's very different to a war where someone's taking him on. This, this has wounded him because it's his players that are the ones turning on him. He wouldn't give a flying... F about uh, another code having a go at him or, or past players, as you mentioned. Th this is who he's trying to protect. And I think that he'll be stunned by the fact that it's the, the, the players who run the game that are turning on him. So it's his, it's his army that want to bring down Napoleon. He's about the same height, I think. I don't know whether he has 10 dozen oysters before uh, every battle like uh, Napoleon did, but no wonder he was ready to go. Um, but yeah, so maybe we should have feels, a little, I'd yeah. love to have a little side bet with him. We'll have a We'll have a friendly beer and um, a dozen oysters on it. What do you reckon? Yeah, may get a lobster as well. He, he'll go because he, he his ego won't be able to handle the fact that he thinks he's loved by the players and there's been a knock on the door telling him he's not. So yeah. he'll We're happy go. with that. Is that the when, lobster when, from what, yesterday that you haven't eaten yet? The which one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, Is that well, finished yet, that horse? Uh, yeah. But did you have the sardines on toast? Oceanarium was good. I can go to the bottom of the ocean for all I care, that horse. Uh, no, I, I, I'm actually very, very confident, and I'm sad to say this because he's done such a great job. He's going to go. All right. Well, we've, well we've, got that, we've got that noted. Uh, Judge, did you want to come in there? Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, but look, firstly, Paul, I read that article, and I thought it was um, one of the more pathetic pieces of so-called journalism I've heard, read for a while. Uh, I hate articles where they name unnamed sources, where well, they refer to unnamed sources and unnamed players, until the players actually come out. I mean, clearly there's a lot of uh, rearguard action about this. Um, but you look at Vlander's going, gee, who's going to fill his place? He's, he's been enormous for the game, and you've been his, his greatest supporter. But I think what he's done wrong uh, is that he's, um, he's taken over the role of the tribunal and, and, and basically said, because he's taken over the role of everything, but he just said, this is what's going to happen with, with the head. 
I'm, the, I'm Napoleon and this is what's going to be the, the, the law. That, that kind of thing needs to be done a lot more subtly. I know subtlety is not part of his uh, kit bag, but I think if they just tip, take a step back, he apologises and says, okay, maybe I've, I've, I've been a bit quick, but we need to protect the head and this is how we'll go about it. Um, and what I was going to say, Professor, is that it segues in what I think should happen with the AFL tribunal um, is that I'm getting a little bit sick of the inconsistency of the tribunal. And they always say, well, we won't use other precedents. We'll look at every case at its, on its merits. And, and I think it's getting a little bit out of control, particularly when it comes to the head. What I'd like to see is um, the, on occasions, the tribunal to appoint a five-person tribunal to do what in, in legal terms we call headline cases, where you know, the, the Court of Appeal, Paul, you'd be aware of this, they set up a, a five-bench tribunal. I said, okay, we are now going to look at sling tackles. We're now going to look at um, dangerous tackling. We're now going to look at head high injuries. We are going to uh, look at a number of cases and give decisions. So umpires, tribunal members, and particularly players will know exactly what it is you can and can't do uh, in relation to tackles. That I think is a better system than this ad hoc uh, case by case basis, uh, which we've got at the moment, which is so um, inconsistent um, that I, I think the players just don't know what they're supposed to do. And I think that kind of approach ought to be adopted. And I think it was adopted in the NRL, Paul, um, and, and Valanis could use this to, to, to say, okay, well, look, we'll, we'll leave it to this uh, five person tribunal. Um, then we'll get some consistency and uh, it'll be for the better, betterment of the game. That's he right. just came in. He came in with this overnight, pretty much. And you said subtlety. Yeah. I, he yeah. makes a bull in a china shop look like Fred Astaire. You know, he, <laughs> he, he he just literally has just ordered people off. It's almost like he's come on the field himself and sent people off. It just happened yeah. overnight. So the rules haven't changed. It's just the way they're being enforced. So the, there needs to be. He, he used some strange analogy. It, it's like a pedestrian going to be hit by a car. You don't wait for it to happen. I, I love an analogy, but I, I'm still trying to work that one out. He, he could have consulted at least with the players and, and phased it in. I, I just think that the, the lack of consultation, given that the rules themselves haven't changed, it's simply the way they're being enforced. I, I think that's his, that's his downfall. To, to use an AFL analogy, he ought to handball it uh, to those that really are qualified to do it, and that's a tribunal. And I'm saying make it a super tribunal uh, for the purpose of giving a headline decisions about what you cannot, can and cannot do on the rugby field and the AFL field. That's yeah. my view, Professor. I'd be, Sarah, I'd be interested in your views on uh, what the judge was talking about. Do you find that the MRO and the tribunal seem to uh, give inconsistent decisions at times? Definitely. And even we were looking at it in the AFL a few weeks ago, um, the tackle that Patrick Dangerfield laid really early on in the season this year was heavily scrutinised by a lot of people. But um, it was compared to a lot of previous incidents where either the repercussions had been more or the repercussions had been a lot less and the intent from Dangerfield had been different to all of those other people. I feel like the people making these decisions take on so many different factors and so many other things that they come up with really inconsistent results. Um, and it's we definitely have to protect people and protecting the head is something that we've discussed previously on the show and has become so much more apparently important in the last couple of years as research has developed. But we need to make sure that we're still looking at other things behind it, like intent. If someone has a lot of intent to hurt someone but doesn't get their head or doesn't actually hurt them, shouldn't that also be penalised to the same degree as if they were going to actually hit them or hurt them? I know it's very drastic, but I'm, and I'm not the best person to speak on it, but if you're looking at someone attempting to do something versus actually executing it, is there a lot of um, situations in sports where people are penalised for attempting to hurt another player or something like that? And how is that penalised in comparison to actually hurting the player? That's, that's an excellent point, Sarah. And yeah. you know what? We've got an expert on those sorts of matters on the panel. Amazing. So what I'm going to do is ask the judge, judge in law, 
where does somebody who attempts <coughs> to copy get as big a sentence as the person who actually does it? Does well, that actually happen? That's a great point, uh, Sarah. If you shoot someone and miss, um, if you apply the AFL tribunal, let's say, well, nothing happened, no, 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 no harm, no foul. Exactly. Um, so uh, it's all good, L lucky you missed. That isn't the case at law. Attempted murder is what you'd be charged with and uh, the penalty will not be a lot less uh, than murder. So I totally agree with you, a great point. I, I think we ought to uh, not look at the consequences of the action, which is what we do at the moment, but what was intended. And the fact that, oh, well, gee, he got up, you know, he, he wasn't uh, knocked out for five weeks. Well, you know, game on, nothing to see here. Totally wrong. I, I think we ought to be uh, punishing intent. Uh, and, and if that was that happened, I, I think there'd be a massive uh, change in attitude towards the players. Great well, it would be interesting for State of Origin because they literally want to kill each other. There'll be no one left on the field. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to get Peter out there with his ball and his whistle. That, uh, yeah, there'll be no one left if, uh, if they take that strong action in State of Origin because they, they don't want to seriously hurt each other, but it, it's the most brutal version of our sport. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. It could end up seven aside, and that's not a joke. Quick question for you, Dan, in, in NFL, because that's probably the uh, best comparison that we've got. Uh, do they look at intent there or do they only penalise incidents that actually happen? No, they, they definitely look at intent, Mark. And I, I know that they've done a lot more uh, on, on the field in, you know, in instant replay and looked at the intent to harm when it comes to head-to-head uh, -head contact. And some of those type of incidents uh, are becoming much more strict, particularly as lawsuits become much more prevalent. Uh, you know, concussion lawsuits and some of the things that we've talked about on this panel before, the way players tackle and the, the intent to harm is definitely looked at uh, relative to on the field actions during the game, but also post uh, actions as well. Uh, the NFL office uh, can go back and look at plays and penalize accordingly as well. Thanks, Dan. Um Gelding, I sent you a uh, an article. Sandpaper yes, Gate, Professor. Sandpaper Gate has raised its head yet again, notwithstanding that it all happened in March 2018, which seems a long time ago. Um, Cameron Bancroft made the mistake of uh, talking to some reporters uh, last weekend, implying that the bowlers knew what was going on. Do we do we really have to go into it all over again? Haven't Hasn't there been an inquiry? Haven't there been penalties handed out? Haven't the penalties been served? Why don't we just get on with it? Um, spot on, Professor. It's one of those things now for the history books of cricket, I think. You just have it. People have been penalised. Um, you know, um, fines have been put out. They've missed tours. There's still cases going on. You know, Warner cannot hold an official position of captain or vice-captain. <laughs> the bowlers say they knew nothing about it. Um, yeah, is, is it just regurgitating a story that's already been headlined and resolved? Um, I don't know, Professor. Yeah, let's move on. Let's put it to bed and move on. More what about that, um, you know, that statement? That statement from the players. I haven't seen a bigger non-statement since Bill Clinton. I didn't have consensual affairs with that woman. <laughs> The that bowlers. statement said nothing at all. The, did, bowlers. Did, the, the bowlers put out a statement saying, take pride in our integrity. It didn't address whether they knew or not. And that was the big question. And I was reading it and reading it and reading it and waiting, waiting, waiting. Mm -hmm. But it didn't, it didn't address the issue. I don't know. Having played cricket for um, a long period of time, if you're handling a ball, you notice any change to it. Like yeah. the bowlers throw the balls to umpires and say the, the seam's crooked. You know, yeah. there's a stitching out or something like that. I'd imagine if a piece of sandpaper was on one side of it, you would know it's a little bit rougher than the other side, wouldn't you? Well, willful, willful blindness. If it's five in the afternoon and it comes back to your hand looking like it's just come from Rebel Sports, uh, yeah. you know something. someone's on, on, on the job. Uh, selective blindness, do you think? That's, that's <laughs> a legal term, I think, isn't it? Willful blindness. <laughs> but, um, there are some stories the media cannot let go. I mean, look at Princess Di's interview. Uh, mm -hmm. with Martin Bashir. That was 1995, 26 years ago. Uh, the interview was what it was, and we're still talking about it now because we have this uh, uh, incessant interest 
in Prince conspiracy of theory. Yeah, and, and we've got an incredible interest in um, the Australian cricket captain cheating. Uh, that'll never go away. That, that, that's just such a, a fascinating storyline that the media can't let it go. In my opinion, it, it, it's done and dusted, but, but that's, that, do tell the media that. It'll always um, be interest. Yeah, that's one of those stories that'll just keep on popping up every now and again. And the one some of these current players write their biographies about it and give their versions of it, it'll be another headline news for a couple of days, you know. It's Someone been happening for years, say, though. I mean, it was bottle tops for a while and it was cool mints for a while as well. I mean, it's been happening for a long time. It's been happening since the day dot. Um, yeah. You know, zinc, zinc, look. <laughs> Geez, I can remember days where I was playing. It was oh, gelding, brother. Don't, don't, don't implicate yourself, gelding. No, no, yeah. no. I'm not saying I did it. I was. <laughs> uh, the limitations are still running, gelding. There was, um, you know, the suntan lotions and things like that. Um, you know, there's the old body of spit that used to come out, or yeah, half lollies. Um, you know, you get that kind of thing. Just a, there'd be heaps of things. There'd been. Fingernails. You've, how many test players have you seen with the subcontinents? And they used to put three, three little fingerprint marks down so the wind would ha- actually get the ball to move. We we'll get seen, Dan to comment because some of those baseball pitchers they've got more grease on their cap than a mechanics workshop. They have, <laughs> well, they inspect their cap. They've got all sorts of substances tucked into the cap and stuff. Yeah. Isn't, oh, yeah. isn't well, it, ha- happened this isn't week? The naked gun giraffe where they show the baseball and he brings out a little. The sandpaper and the drill and all That's that it, thing. Yeah. It's just a, all the things that, you know, the Vaseline, the, um, you and know, Dan, all those Dan, things. Sorry, Dan, didn't the baseball uh, has, itself has some controversy this week? Yeah, actually it did. Uh, Car- uh, St. Louis Cardinals uh, player was warming up. Giovanni uh, Gallegos uh, was warming up relief pitcher. And before uh, he could even throw a pitch, uh, the umpire, Joe West, who had just set the record, for number of games umpired in major league baseball. I mean, Joe West, I think was my goodness in the seventies. I think Joe was, was calling baseball games. He's still calling them, but he actually uh, asked the, the pitcher to uh, change his cap and the, uh, um, the general manager, the manager for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals came out and raised a stink about it. And the uh, manager got thrown out of the game. Uh, but you know, it was, as he said, it was it's baseball's dirty little secret. It's things that are under the cap. Uh, I mean, if you guys have ever seen the movie, Major League, um, you know, you get yeah. the, the old pitcher that's out there. He's got, you know, things on his shirt, you know, in his, in his shirt, and, you know, yeah. in the hat. And he's talking about all kinds of substances they've thrown on the ball to get anything he can on it. I mean, as, as the manager said, the Cardinals said, it's baseball's dirty little secret. It's things that continue to happen. Uh, but, you know, Mark and I would appreciate this as I'm, you know, recovering from a little bit of surgery on my head. Oh, he was just trying – it was just sunblock. He was just trying to keep, you know, from preventing melanoma and – you know, skin cancer, you know, it wasn't anything other than that. So it is, it's crazy what's going on. But yeah, it just happened this, just two days ago in St. Louis. Yeah. Surprising how many in, uh, in lawn bowls where they, uh, they shave their lawn bowls. So there's, there's lovely little pensioners um, going back to their um, lathe machine back home and uh, shaving the balls so they go straight. So it's not just the, these sports that it goes in. Mm. Uh, you'd be interested to also know lip balm was always one of the favourites. You know, you could put it in your pocket and, you know, because you didn't want to get a sunburned lip, you know, or anything like that. You'd have the big hat on. But um, a lot of bowlers seem to have lip balm more than the batsman. So, so I'm starting to wonder when the Gelding's autobiography is coming out, boys and girls. Here, so. <laughs> uh, it's not, not going to be too long. Um, <laughs> Judge, during the week, uh, we swapped some articles about uh, Naomi Osaka decided, has decided not to talk to the press during the French Open, which starts uh, tonight, I think. Um, damaging to the mental health of players, she said. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I totally agree with her, um, Professor. For a different reason, um, I just think they're a total waste of time. Um, it's not journalism. Uh, it's just really uh, uh, a boring uh, episode which players have to endure. Um, nothing ever comes out of them. Um, and it's often a... Uh, uh, I think a sad occasion when when a, a player is you know is, is beaten and they're, they're feeling horrible and the um, journalists just pile in on them and and, um, and by the way they're not journalists they're, they're these people they're just looking for a gotcha moment from the from the uh, the player um, 
and uh, that they become a total waste of time. I don't know anybody who uh, who loves the game, who actually loves to watch the post-match interview. So I think good on it. And it's about time they got rid of this interview and and also the uh, a lot of the um, football interviews that, uh, well, supposed interviews that go on. I think they're a waste of time. I was going to say, I wish some of the rugby league players didn't speak. They say things like, it's good to get the win. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, it's like saying I hate paper cuts. You know? Um, you know, good to get the win. Forward, we're going forward. It doesn't add much at all. But some of the players, it, it's quite enlightening when you see some players, you can actually speak like Pappenhausen. But some of the players, just moronic. And it, it, it really yeah. doesn't offer much at all. There was one player that came yeah, out. Professor, can I ask yeah. John and your opinion and Giraffe's opinion and Sarah's opinion on it? I understand, John and I agree completely with you. These after game interviews, you know, just useless and things like that. But she got paid $36 million last year. She earned in sponsorship apart from winning tournaments and all that. If you were a sponsor and all of a sudden you would say, we're going to pay you $10 million less because you're not doing interviews and our brand isn't on the TV or anything like that. Do you reckon she'd start doing them again? Well, for some, not only so, I think it's the most uh, well-paid athlete, female athlete in the world. So $36 million think, she raised last year. How much? $36 million. Yeah. So I don't think that really worries her. Uh, I, I think sponsors should get a, a better outlet uh, for their sponsorship dollar than uh, boring the heck out of the uh, people who are watching the interview. I don't, I don't think they're getting anything out of it. Oh, and to be honest, I, I agree I would with you on that. Who, who sponsored Naomi Osaka? Yeah, Wasn't she only she saying she didn't want to talk after, after a loss? Income. It was only after a loss, wasn't it, she didn't want to talk? It reminds me of um, when Daniel Andrews every day fronting up. I was waiting for North Face to say, can you get our jacket off? Because every day <laughs> you're talking about people dying <laughs> in, in one of our wind cheaters. Get it off and just put on something black without our name on it but anyway I, it, it, what i'm saying is if your name is sponsor and she's just been pounded do you really want your name there sarah <laughs> oh, i'm sure any publicity is good publicity isn't it is that the old saying sarah your thoughts um it's very hard because there's a lot of people who argue that it's great because we're going back to what the sport is about which is focusing on the sport rather than the media publications around it um, but it's also an opportunity, I guess, for her to make her own stand and control the voices that she's putting out or the thoughts that she's putting out. I know that when you're on the spot and in front of a camera that could be broadcasting what's happening to millions of people, you kind of get a bit of uh, caught up and you get caught in your brain and you're not sure what you're going to say. At least this way, maybe she might be able to convey her opinions and thoughts post games and post tournaments and after any sort of incident in relation to her career, she can dedicate that through her social media channel, which we're seeing a lot more athletes do. We're finding so much more personal information through athletes' social media channels. So maybe we'll still get that kind of information from her, but just from a different platform. I was going to say, Gilding, um, in the big bash, I, I still think they interview players as they're walking off when they get out. I know in yep. my cricket career, there were times when I got out, I wasn't up for a chat because there might have been a flying bat or something. So it, it, it's always interesting to see in the big bash when they talk to someone who's just got out. Now, how is it out there? And yeah, it's great, but I'm out. So yeah. um, Going on that one, isn't the famous interview was Chris Carl in the big bash. He got <laughs> out and was being interviewed and and then ask the interviewer out for a drink that night. That's it, yeah. So he's... There's some different there's some different units out there. Do they add much? I don't think so. Do the TV channels want them? Yes, because I don't know why. They Gil, think Gil, it's it, it they think time, it's good. Gilding. I agree with John. I find them completely useless. But it fills, it fills time, Gelding. Yeah, it and I tell you what, you know, people pay a lot to get to be on their um, shirts and things like that. And Professor, I don't know. Professor, my idea of personal hell uh, is being in hell uh, tied to a chair and having to listen to Greg Norman uh, doing his pre-game, uh, pre-round interviews, uh, being in awe of himself and how wonderful he's going to be today and, and all the rest of it. There is one bloke I cannot listen to is Greg Norman. So uh, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. Did you read this week he's moving back to Australia? Oh. You're going to have him for a while yet because he said, I'm going to live till I'm 110. I thought it was very precise. <laughs> Not just 100. Something to look forward to. 
He's right, not uh, shy of being a fan of his own work, the Shark. <laughs> All right, uh, Dan, very quickly before we talk to you about the NBA, um, have you seen anything less interesting than the interviews with NFL coaches as they come off the field at halftime? I, uh, you get, you gain absolutely nothing out of it as far as I'm concerned. What are your thoughts? No, it, it's crazy, Mark, how, how the networks uh, – started implementing this is not just in football, but in basketball and other, and, you know, other sports, pulling them off at halftime to do an interview and then, you know, post game right around right the court or doing live interviews while you're trying to coach a game. I don't get the human interest in it. There's never an answer that anybody wants to hear. Um, and usually it, it's upsetting to the coach, uh, particularly if they're, you know, just had a bad play right before they go off at halftime. So I go back to, to Marshawn Lynch's uh, quote, I'm only here so I don't get fined. That's kind of what the uh, situation is with those halftime interviews is I'll do it so I don't get fined. Just uh, yes, no, get me off, and I've got to get into my team. So I, I, I think they're they're not entertaining, they're not informative, and I don't know why the uh, networks continue to want to try to do them. They're not exactly going to get out their playbook, are they, and say, this is what we're going to do in the second half. We're going <laughs> to go to page 37, and then we're going to try and stop <laughs> this running back. I mean, give me strength. <laughs> I always love those questions, Paul, when, when you got the uh, – you know, whoever the, re the sideline reporter is, is what are you going to change in the second half? Well, like I'm going to tell you and they're going to, you know, that's like, <laughs> you got to come up with something that's a little bit more original than what, what adjustments are you going to make in the second half? So, <laughs> uh, Dan, uh, the NBA playoffs are in town and the Knicks finally won a playoff game. They did. It's, it's crazy. I, I was on a media interview yesterday with a, a station here in, in California and uh, they were talking about the Madison Square Garden. And boy, you know, how great is it to see Madison Square Garden uh, lit up like it was when the Knicks won? I said, well, if you were a Knicks fan and you haven't seen the Knicks do anything since Patrick Ewan, you'd be lit up and cheering as well. Uh, and it's pretty much what I mean, we've talked about the Knicks over the years here on this on this show, guys. But uh, obviously it's it's still a tough go for the Knicks. They're down 2 one in their series to Atlanta uh, with a game on national TV here tomorrow. And, uh, they, they last won a playoff game when Sinatra released New York, New York, didn't they? Was it that long ago? <laughs> I think it was. Well, it, it's crazy how long, you know, we've talked about uh, how, how you could be in a major metro metropolitan market like that and not have a winning franchise. So for them to get the playoffs this year was a great accomplishment. Uh, but it, it was great, to be honest, guys, to even see Madison Square Garden and I think 75% of people in the building and see it lit up like that was just fun to watch after a COVID year. So perhaps... The question to ask, Dan, is out of the results so far in these playoffs, anything surprised you at all? You know, not much, Mark. I mean, you see Phil, uh, the Phoenix Suns down 2-1 to one to the Lakers, but we talked about this a few weeks back. I don't think I'd want to be any team playing the defending champs if you get LeBron back and Anthony Davis back. And the Lakers go as Anthony Davis goes. I mean, LeBron could be as good as he can be, but if Anthony Davis is playing great, it's, it's tough to stop the Lakers, and they're up 2-1. to one. Uh, in that series right now. Some of the series are, are very early uh, and there's Milwaukee swept the Miami heat uh, just destroyed them. I mean, Milwaukee's on a, on a four game run there, beat them four to nothing. Uh, Philadelphia's, you know, doing the same thing with Washington. They're currently up three to nothing, but nothing really surprising yet. The series are, are pretty tough. The Clippers had to get a win on the road at Dallas to prevent going down three, nothing uh, yesterday. So they did get that win, but uh, it's going to be exciting to see what the Lakers and Phoenix Suns do here in the games ahead. Well, if Kuda was here, he'd ask you uh, about the Nuggets. Uh, can they overcome Portland? I think they can. I mean, obviously, they're uh, they're tied right now, 2-2. Uh, two -two. Portland's won a couple games uh, here. But I think Denver Denver can get it done. Portland's a tough challenge. Obviously, has some pretty good talent as a sixth seed. But I still think Denver can get that done. They got uh, home court advantage. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Gelding will fin finalise the show with you today. Tell us. What's going to win at Ballarat? Oh, excuse me, Professor. <coughs> um, like a couple late in the day, Professor. Uh, at four o'clock, race seven, number five, Bet Red. Mick Price, M. Kent Jr., D. Yendel around. You can get round about the 370 at the moment. And in race eight, we both like this one, Professor, number 10, keep on bopping by uh, Stokes and Allen. You can get round about the four, 440. And Professor, I've had a great time today just writing down some of the quotes from Giraffe. Whether you want me to go through some of them? Can I add one to that? 
keep on bopping sounds like Djokovic in COVID when he was at that nightclub. Well, so far with we've his shirt off. More, so far we've had more fireworks than in Chinatown on New York Eve. Reed Maloney should have been in Police Academy. Panthers have got a better nursery than Jamie Jury. Schooner should be upgraded to a pint. I like that one the best. <laughs> Peter Blandy's must have more balls than Keno. That's probably number two. Oceanarium should go to the bottom of the ocean. Um, Peter Volandis makes a ball in a China store look like Fred Astaire. Greg Norman, fan of his own work. And the Knicks, last one, a playoff game when Sinatra released New York, New York. Uh, so they, they, he they, keeps they, they, with they, the entertainment collection. Well done. They, yeah. There's one yeah. fire, Paul. Must have been something in the coffee this morning. Yeah. Uh, I certainly like Schooner should be upgraded to a pint, <laughs> Professor. Yeah, before we finish, the, the other one I liked was uh, he had more grease on his cap than in a mechanic shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I couldn't write them all down, Professor. No, I know that. All right. Well, uh, look, thank you for your participation today, panel. Uh, everybody stay safe and uh, we'll see you all again next week. Good afternoon. Yes.